Good evening. I'm Amy Manon Ogg, moderator of the Heritage Hour, brought to you by the Filipino Heritage Society of Montreal. Our main goal is to promote our Filipino heritage. Young people bringing new life to our heritage. So tonight, to raise young people's awareness of the importance of heritage, conservation and preservation, sharing and enhancing, we have our very own Stephanie Valenzuela as our guest. Stephanie Valenzuela, Municipal Candidate for Councillor of Darlington District. A candidate that better represents the community where she grew up and still lives. Stephanie studied Political Science at McGill University and graduated in 2014. She is a former Director of Communication and Public Relations at Fundacia La Paz Cuneza con los Niños, a non-government organization in Monterrey, Mexico. Presently, she is the Filipino Heritage Society of Montreal Communication Director. She speaks four languages, French, English, Spanish, and Tagalog. Being active with another Filipino community association, she can bring to the council her personal and community knowledge. For tonight's panelists, we have members of the Filipino Heritage Society of Montreal. We have Kim Golcha, our director of Outreach, and Stephanie Slecht. We have Rebecca Aguilar, coordinator of our special project in the far right. In my right, far right, yeah. And of course, we have Sylvia Lamere, one of our directors. And how are you, Steph, tonight? I'm very well, thank you. What do you cherish most that you have lived all your life and now you will be representing uh, if you win? Um, what I cherish most about Darlington is definitely the first memories I've ever had. Um, and that was memories of my childhood. Uh, growing up in Darlington, it's a very, very different uh, reality as opposed to um, living in different uh, other boroughs. Growing up in Darlington, I lived in an um, apartment building um, until I was about eight, nine years old. And because of the environment that we lived in, it was a very open um, experience. It was almost similar to living in the Philippines where you had free time to run everywhere. Your parents kind of didn't have to know exactly where you were because they trusted your their neighbors. They trusted um, the people around us. And for me, it wasn't, um, it wasn't uh, growing up in fear. It was growing up um, with the understanding that the people around us were there to to take care of us and to nurture us and they had our best interest at heart. So for me growing up in Darlington, that was my best experience. That was my first memory and that's what allowed me to really understand the diversity in our area and to understand that the Filipinos in Darlington have always been family, have always been home. So um, my question is about um, the issues in your district. So what do you think is the biggest issue that needs to be addressed in your district? Personally, for me, the two issues that really affect me the most is the lack of affordability and accessibility to, um, to homes or to apartments in general. I think it's a really big issue on the island of Montreal, as we all know. The increase of um, the price of rent is just going up because of the lack of um, availability of, of apartments and apartments in decent condition. So for me personally, that's something that I would really like to address is not just access to good apartments, but the maintenance of good apartments. And the second thing that I really want to work on in Darlington, which I believe Lionel has been doing an amazing job at, but I, I would like to see more services uh, for the youth in our area. I really think that because we we are in a neighborhood that has a lot of um, 
income uh, disproportions in different areas of the borough, we, we find ourselves with um, children that are growing up in smaller spaces with a lot of family members. They don't have enough space. And I think that by investing in these kinds of infrastructures and programs for the youth, we're giving them a better chance at a better future. You know, we're teaching them discipline, we're teaching them, um, you know, extracurricular activities. We're giving them space to um, to interact with people their age and to, to focus on things aside from maybe education if they're more sporty and they don't have the funds to, you know, have equipment or to pay for training. These are things that I believe the borough can invest in and I believe my team can do that. What advice can you give the young generation who wants to follow your footsteps in politics? Uh, what I will give for the next generation um, that is interested in politics and that don't know where to start, I think the best thing to do is to simply get involved with your community. Um, there's no other way of joining politics if you don't actually know what's happening on the ground and where the needs are, not just in your specific ethnic community, but in your local community in general. Um, one of my awakening moments was when I worked in Mexico actually and I've always been someone that was very humanitarian and looking to do work abroad and trying to bring the privilege that I had here in Canada to other countries that didn't have that privilege and actually that inspiration came from visiting the Philippines the first time when I was a little girl because it was such a it was such a, not a culture shock, but it was such an eye-opening experience that privilege is luck. Depending on where you're born, depending on you know the situation that you live in, it's pure luck. I could have been born in the Philippines and my life could have been completely different, right? Um, so when I worked in Mexico and I came back here, I realized, I said, I can't just make a difference in another country. I can also make a difference here at home. And to, to do that at home, you need to start with the people around you. You need to start with the people you know. And that's my advice. If you're going to go into politics and you have, you know, um, you, you really want to get involved, I think the best way to get involved is to start at home, to start with your base, to ask questions, um, try to, to reach out to your elected official, because I'm sure they would like to mentor you. I'm sure they would like to... Um, you know, give you some advice. So I feel like that's the best way to start. I, I would say it's accurate to say that you were born and raised in the riding you are representing. If so, in my opinion, you're the best candidate to represent Darlington. My question to you is, uh, with, uh, first of all, uh, with your credentials and your charisma, this election for you is a win. My question is, um, if you are elected, what steps would you do to make a difference for the quality of life for people in your riding? Um, so for me, the main thing that I think is important as an elected official is to consult and to listen and to, um, to really understand what are the real needs because I can have an idea or um, a solution or a plan, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the people living in the area will agree to it or it for them it's not necessarily the best way to do it. So the main thing I would do, which is what I've started to do already since I've announced, is I've been talking to a lot of the people in the area uh, through door knocking, through the calling, through events. Um, I've been speaking to people and I've been listening to them on what are their concerns, what are their um, priorities, what are their main issues. So I, I know for a fact, based on what have, I've been hearing, there's a there's been a lot of uh, problems in you know maintaining um, the district and keeping it clean uh, because of the various. Um, living situations and the types of homes in the area. If you go from one street to another, you have duplexes and then you have um, apartment buildings. And so I think that we really need to work on 
a strategic way of keeping the area clean and, and making sure that, you know, everybody is treated respectfully in their area and that they have a place that they can call home. So mainly for me, as I had mentioned before, I really want to focus on housing because it's a right. It, it is not a privilege to, to have a home to, to go home to, to have a roof over your head to protect you every night. Yes, there's going to be um, discrepancies depending on how much you make, but everyone should go home to a home. And I think that that's a main basic universal right. Um, so main things that I would I would focus my attention on after being elected or if I get elected uh, would be that would be uh, housing. It's a big crisis would be uh, accessibility and resources for our youth because they're our future and uh, really cleanliness and you know uh, maintaining our services and making them better because at the municipal level those are the things that we target the most and that's what we can act upon. Uh, there are three things that uh, that comes into you being a candidate. What are the challenges you have met being a woman, a young one, and a member of the visible minority? Yeah, so um, definitely as a young woman from a visible um, minority category, one of the main challenges I feel like I've had uh, since my announcement and since I've really jumped into politics is um, the lack of, not respect per se, but it's something that's deeply enrooted in society and culture is the objectification of a woman. So um, when I usually get into conversations, you know, it's politically geared and, um, you know, we, we all have a level of respect for each other. Um, but because I'm a woman and because maybe I'm young or to others I might be attractive or not, maybe, um, but I'll get, you know, a very, um, very, not disrespectful, I would say, but it's just, I would get catcalled and it's, I just literally just had a political uh, speech and then right after I would get catcalled by someone or I will receive a Facebook message saying, oh, you're so beautiful, um, you know, can, can I have your number? Can I talk to you? It's, we're at a political level. We are supposed to act professionally. And although, you know, I understand I'm a woman, maybe they think it's okay, but I don't see my colleague my men colleagues getting messages from women after a speech and I think that it's just the double standard is it because I am a woman and because I am a public figure now so I have easy access to to conversate with other people so I think there is that aspect and there's also when you're the only female in the room and you are a visible minority you have a tendency to uh, take a step back and just listen and allow yourself to, you know, become a fly in the wall. And this is something I have had to learn over the last few months is to really to step up and to take space and to not be afraid of saying something that maybe not everyone will agree with, but because of my lived experience, I have the right to say it and I should say it freely and, you know, forcefully. So those are the main things I feel as a woman, as a visible minority, I've had a little bit of struggle with, but I'm working on it. But you know what Margaret Pastor said? In politics, if you want anything said as a man, if you want anything done as a woman. Yeah. I think that, that you describe just what many women experience, you know, so uh, thank you for describing that so so well. Um, and for my question, I'd like us to go a little uh, back, a few years back in your life, and I'd like us to talk about your previous year experience, so I find it very interesting. So I'd like to ask, can you tell us about your work as Director of Public Relations and Communications for a not profit organization in Mexico? Uh, so, my work in Mexico actually um, entailed um, a lot of work 
with the private sector and the public sector. So as Director of Communications and Public Relations for uh, La Paz Comienza con los Niños, Peace Begins with Children, I was mainly the person that um, was trying to receive grants or uh, funding for the programs enabled uh, for us to be able to put these programs in the uh, primary schools and the um, high schools. So basically the program, La Paz Comienza con los Niños, it's a program to put in schools uh, to help children stay away from, um, you know, like the traffic of drugs, which was, uh, which is a big problem in Mexico through the cartel. And so I was working in Monterrey in um, the border of uh, Texas and Mexico, where there's a lot of high traffic. Um, and there was a period in uh, 2009 to 2014, uh, 2013, I would say, uh, right before I went there, where um, it was a really big problem in, in Mexico, uh, whether it was the violence, the drug cartel, um, it was huge. So the founder of the organization, La Paz Comienza con los Niños, uh, she was my professor at McGill. And um, she put me in charge basically of looking for grants, whether it was in Canada or in Mexico. Uh, I was also in charge of fundraising. I was in charge of communication. Um, I was in charge of basically anything that had to do with documentation and administrative work for the organization. And it was the best experience for me, honestly, uh, to do that work and to see the fruit of its labor, to see children, um, you know, in safe spaces. Um, because mainly the, the program as well um, allowed for kids to stay longer at school, um, which was the main problem because when you finish school at 3 p.m. and your parents are still working until 7, 8 p.m., you're left alone on the streets by yourself. And when you're young, you kind of, not kind of, you need the guidance of your parents. And without your parents there, you're vulnerable um, to anyone. And unfortunately, gang members, they don't care how old you are. They don't care uh, about your future. They will use you to, um, to get whatever they want. Um, so this was an amazing program. It still exists, it is still working, and it is um, an, a, an amazing, amazing, amazing thing that I, I was very, very lucky and privileged to be a part of. And through this work, I was able to learn a lot, and hopefully I'll be able to apply this to being a city councilor here in Montreal. What level of success has brought you by entering politics? Is it stressful or satisfying? Um, I think in life, nothing is ever straight and narrow. Um, we can always agree that there are good parts and bad parts about it, and there will always be sacrifices and compromises to whatever journey you decide to take in life. Um, but I have to say that in this specific situation, it is living my dream. It is, despite all the hard work and the loss of sleep and the time, there is no other experience like this. When you get the privilege to hear people's stories, when you earn their trust, when you are invited to uh, you know events that you have, would have never had the chance to be invited to when you get to learn about people's cultures and you're genuinely welcomed into their homes i think that this is like zero comparison and i always say this because i cannot take anything for granted and i also you know uh you never know there's really um, no way of guaranteeing whether I win or whether I lose um, but for me this entire experience is already a win and I am very grateful for all the people that I've had the chance to meet all the people that have influenced my life by one single conversation and I hope that they genuinely believe from the conversations that I've had with them that I do really care and that I hope to make a difference in the future of Darlington. 
how do you plan to involve the residents in your riding in the decision making process of your region? Um, so in the next few weeks we are going to be um, announcing our platform uh, locally and um, the citywide platform and I'm, I'm very proud of it and I'm very pleased because I truly believe that this platform is inclusive, it's innovative and it will bring an extreme amount of um, well-needed investments into not just my district of Darlington but into the entire borough of uh, Cadenage Notre Dame de Cas. So um, I believe that with my team of um, my local team here of Cadenage Notre Dame de Cas that we are going to be able to really bring in all the input of the residents and we're going to be able to have you know a solid plan not just you know little changes here and there but a solid vision for the for the area that everyone will be able to benefit from so hopefully in the next few weeks this is something that we'll be able to discuss not just with myself but with the entire team and i'm very very proud of it and i i know that it will make a difference in in Kodanej and darlington specifically how about your experience in a community as filipino association in montreal uh, that you can share with us? Yes, uh, so, I mean, I, since I was a little girl, I've always been kind of um, involved in different community work. My parents have always been uh, extremely active in the Filipino community. My mom is a member of the Panday Pan Choir. Both my parents are part of um, Alpha Phi Omega. So growing up, I was always like, sinusundan ko lang sila, where I, uh, join a party with them, I help them do a street cleaning, I help them with flower distribution or, you know, Emma Quebec uh, blood drive. So it was always kind of in my sister and I's DNA to um, be part of a community effort. And my parents really showed us the importance of working with the community, not just the Filipino community, but the community in general in Montreal. Um, but for the Filipino community specifically, it was my introduction on, you know, what it really means to have a community and what it really means to be supported by a community. I mean, we're not a perfect community. We can all agree that we have our flaws. Um, but genuinely, we are a community that supports each other. We are a community that wants to progress and that wants to strive for success. And I think that when you keep those values and ideas in mind and you focus on the positive, we're able to grow exponentially. And I think this is proof of the Filipino community's success in the last 30, 40, 50 years. It's, it's importance now in the Montreal society. You know, if it weren't for the great work of people like Tita Lilia Esquera or Bert Abiera, where they've made a dent in the Montreal um, society, I would not have probably been paid attention to as a young female trying to enter politics. It's the effort of our community here that has given us a spotlight and now it's time for us to use it and shine. So I, I, I am grateful for the Filipino community. Without them, I would not be who I am today. Personally for me, um, I've always been very critical of any politician that, you know, comes to our events because the reality of it is it's politics, right? Um, but when you have real politicians that genuinely care and don't just show up for a photo op, that's when you know that these are politicians that will make a difference and that are not taking your vote for granted. You know, they truly understand the work that needs to be put in and, you um, and those are the politicians that, that will go far and that have done so much. Like, for example, Mr. Marvin Rotran, 39 years of service. It's not for nothing that he was continuously elected. It's because of the dent that he's made in every single community, Filipino, Jamaican, Bangladeshi. You know, he he's honestly an inspiration to me because after all these months of working with with Marvin 
he's so genuine that it's it's amazing to see that a, a politician like him, despite all the work that he's done, uh, you know, on the policy levels, he really takes the time to answer every single call, every single email, and I, I look up to him, and I hopefully I can maybe not be exactly like him, but hopefully I can follow really into his footsteps. Besides being inspired by Mr. Otran, Stephanie, yeah. who are the other inspirations in your life? It's, it's kind of cheesy, but it's really my mom and dad. I, I have to say that my parents are really my role models. They worked extremely hard for my sister and myself. Um, until I was in high school, my dad worked 16 hour uh, days to, you know, pay for the mortgage, pay for our studies, um, have food on our table every day. And my mom has always been the most supportive person. She's like my number one volunteer right now. And um, for me, they're my role models. If there's anyone or there's any person that can that I can say made me who I am today, it's my parents from the fundamental values that I truly believe in to the culture that I represent to, you know, the respect that I have and that I give, it's from my parents. And um, I, I really wouldn't be here without them. So they're my role models. This is says that when you give a community service, it, you, it will end up with peace. So that is really, yeah. That's why I think with Filipino Heritage uh, Society of Montreal, we're giving service and we're really for peace so that we'll all, all live in harmony and we can give it to the next generation. And that's the, my favorite part about Filipino Heritage Society of Montreal is people don't realize how much work you all put into this. It isn't just, you know, uh, small zooms here and there. It's a significant amount of time and dedication, not just to an organization, but to a community and um, and I, I, I admire I admire everything that you guys have done throughout the years and really at the end of the day it's every single one of you you've put in the work for us to be where we are today to have a path you know to to be able to to voice our opinion to be able to you know um, own the businesses that we own now it's because of all the previous generations that have made it here in Montreal. And my generation, unfortunately, sometimes this is the case where there's such a lack, a disconnect between the older generation and the younger generation. And I would hope that, you know, with people like me and Kim, we can build that bridge so that these generations finally understand the importance of sharing the knowledge and the culture that we have. So we wish Stephanie good luck and with the municipal election campaign in full swing, Quebec will head to the vote, or of course we have to vote, November to the polls, but we have an advanced voting October 13th and 31st and then November 6 and 7. So, Montreal is known for its culture, cultural, ethnic, and racial diversity. So it is time to have a Filipino-Canadian in our council representing the visible minority. So thank you, Steph. Thank and you. And we will, we will give you a lot of thank you. the standing election. To our panelists, Tim, Rebecca, Sylvia, it's Amy Mananó, the Filipino Heritage Society of Montreal Heritage Hour. Good night, and we'll see you again.